again, everybody. Um, everyone enjoyed their day so far? Yes! Someone just did so. No, we've had a, I don't know, it's a really wonderful day. It's great to, uh, to uh, have, meet all the fans and have a, a really wonderful, rewarding day. But we're not done yet. Um, John Green is just, you know, just, he's just out there having a chat. <laughs> I was kind of lauding out there, having a chat and a drink, sort of wandering around. Look, he gave us away, John. Yeah. Anyway, he's asked me to do the introduction. Oh, yeah. John, the last, the last time I did, uh, it's not often we get the chance to hear and watch and see and learn from one of the greatest living fantasy artists. Um, his mind is my great pleasure. Um, and I'm honoured to be able to introduce him to you. Thank 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 you. <laughs> Not only did he um, come to us many years ago and wants to do work at Games Workshop, he painted four of my Final Fantasy game book covers, which have become iconic and uh, renowned around the world as being state of the art for a particular genre at that time. He also, of course, created Darth Maul and done other loads of things. Not only that, he's a wonderfully brilliant human being. So, can you please give a big hand to the amazing Ian McKay. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> All right. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, one thing I did not expect, which is what's so fun about these live shows, is I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Thank God for the lightsaber. Um, but, uh, but I may have to uh, um, croak a little bit at you. And, and also, have you noticed that fighting fantasy, if you read it long enough, changes you? Right? First of all, you grow wrinkles. You start to lose hair. And your voice starts to lose the bass register. Can you sound like this? <laughs> so, if I mutate in front of you, it's just because I also love fighting fantasy and have read it for years. I was a fan when I actually started doing this stuff. Uh, I will show you. When I began, long, long ago, I looked like this. <laughs> I was a drummer in a band at art school. That's because my dad is an expat Scot, which means everything was Scotland, but we lived in Canada. <laughs> so as a kid, I wore a kilt. I highland dance, I still do, over three sharp swords, no toes. And I, um, I learned that one day we'd go back and free Scotland from the English. <laughs> And we did. One day my dad gave us the sign, grab your claymores, it's time! So off we went as a family. I've been, I've been away from my family for four years. I left home at 14. Don't do that at home. But I did. And took care of myself. I didn't get up to trouble because they left me with a movie camera. And they left me with a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and an old-fashioned typewriter. So I made radio plays every weekend. I made movies with my friends every month. And I wrote Pulp Fiction by the time. And then at 18, just as I get ready to go off into the world and write novels, my dad says, grab your claymore. It's time. So off to Scotland. We land. Nobody's wearing kilts. What the heck? No, nobody hiding and dancing on the streets. And I, this sounds like a story, but it's true. And it was heartbroken. He had all these illusions of what Scotland was, and it wasn't. So he went back home to San Francisco and never came back to Scotland again. Meanwhile, here I am, growing up on all sorts of rich fantasy and horror and science fiction, coming to this crusty, old, dark, soot-stained place full of statues you can barely make out, and I fell madly in love with it and the people. I lived in the slums of Glasgow between two gangs that were trying to kill each other. You will learn to walk down the street and just look to that side of a face. Never look at the face of the little kid. Except for once. Because I have 
Folks, that's how you open stuff. But I have this weird superhero gene inside me that will get me killed one day. And that is if someone is hurt or picked upon, I must defend. You can tell because the eyes go slightly red. I stop breathing. And I stand in front of the bus and save the person. In this case, it was me and a friend walking down the street. My friend with wears glasses. It's a little awkward. He looked at the gang member in the eye. Gang boss, there were six of them, reached out to slap him on the side of the head. His glasses fell off. Shh, broke on the ground. Turn into the air, giant! And I said, wait here. Turned around, ran back. Jumped in front of the gang. I said, excuse me. One of you just hit my friend. Which one was it? And they're all like looking at each other and looking at this kid. And they go, one of them comes forward. And he says, it was me. What about it? And I went, well, you heard him. I think you owe him an apology. <laughs> I go, oh, F you. What are you going to do about it? So I hit him. I hit him. I knocked him out. <laughs> the trick is. Make sure you have a can of coke in your hand first. <laughs> Don't let go as you hit him. I decked him, and his friends all just froze and looked, and suddenly they started laughing. And the little voice that the iron giant went away, and the little voice in my head said, Run, run, or you will die. <laughs> Done. So that was my life in, in Glasgow. I heard it's since been cleaned up, it was a city of culture. Amazing, amazing. But I miss those days with those warm-hearted people. <laughs> but they were. If you weren't looking them in the eye and your car had a flat tire, they might come out and change it instead of seeing the car or the tire. So I left the place. I fell in love. I stayed. I would be there still. Except the day I graduated, the last publisher in Scotland, Collins, closed their doors. So there was no work for me in Scotland. And like a lot of young Scottish artists, I packed my bags. And I came to London. Remember now, I had no problem with English. In fact, later I married my Portuguese wife and had my two English children. My dad never forgave me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I came down to London. Uh, the only other event that had happened in between that and me taking my portfolio out to look for work was this weird booklet. It was all typewritten with spelling mistakes, all sorts of things. It is staple bound and sold by a company called King's Workshop and it said across the front, Dungeons and Dragons. Nobody knew what that was, except for my smarter older brother, who roped me in and we played Dungeons and Dragons every night for the end of my art school right through to when I came down to London. So of course, here I am wondering, well, where am I going to work? Where am I going to work? Where's King's Workshop? And I found him. I found him in Hammersmith. I ran down there met Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson. <laughs> they too have spent too many years with fighting fantasy and have mutated beyond recognition. But once Ian had a little caterpillar under his nose and hair on top. And anyway, I showed them my work. And in Scotland, my work was frowned on for a very traditional art school at Glasgow. You do not draw things that don't exist. And I painted a dragon right around the studio, which they painted off the day I graduated. But I had a picture of it, and I showed them. And they went, oh my god, well, we don't really have something right today, but would you do us a carrier right? <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes, I will. I have no idea what they were or what they were about, but it seemed right that a space man should play against the Bulgarian, because <laughs> why not? And since then, they started giving me work on White Dwarf and some of the game covers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Ian invited me more and more into um, offering suggestions for things. You know, a lot of creative people, they're very insecure, you know, and they will shut you down. Ah, idea, back off. With James Cameron, he will pick up the chair and throw it across the room, especially if you're in it. <laughs> so, Ian didn't, and he invited me to feel like I was a part of these books. I missed the first one that was busy. It was busy, stupid me. But then along came Forrest of Doomy and says, I'm writing this one myself, would you? And that's as far as he got before. I went, yes, 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 what is it? Who is it? What is it? 
And the thing I love about this genre, especially when you're doing art for it, unlike every other kind of cover or painting or whatever, where it's a picture of a bit of a story and they're very involved doing what they're supposed to be doing, in fighting fantasy, you just walked in the door. And whatever they were doing, they stopped and they saw you. Right? And that changes it. When the book cover is looking at you, it's not a normal illustration. And I love that aspect of it. Got turned into a book. I never thought they'd do it. You know, because here's a monster with beautiful sunshine behind him. But yeah, got turned into a book. You discover too early on that um, you have no control over the type. So there went my beautiful sunshine. <laughs> oh man. Um, he invited me to do the second book, um, and this time to illustrate the insides as well. So, this is the next best thing to writing the whole thing yourself. Somebody does all the hard work, lets you give suggestions, and you get to illustrate everything. Holy cow! So I started doing this stuff, and I want to point out, this is the first one where I actually learned how to paint watercolor for real. That is watercolor, but if you look carefully, I cross-hatched all my shading. I didn't know how to blend my colors. But that one I learned. Right? Oh, I'm still cross-hatching things here. Um, people have said that there's a resemblance between this character and another one that I invented. <laughs> we will deal with that in just a moment. In fact, during this talk, I will reveal lots of secrets I've never told to anyone. Um, for the insides, it was important to me that you didn't just draw an orc. Right? It had to be a character. And that began what went through all of my film design. I never just draw someone, a stormtrooper. I never just draw whatever it happens to be. It has to be that stormtrooper on that day. And what he had for breakfast? So, sour belly and fat nose. That's all I need. I need a couple of words and you can grow a character from it. Actually, just look around the room really briefly right now. Right? You're all human beings. Why don't you all look the same? You're all responding to the same weather. And you still, nobody's dressed the same. You've all had a long day. Look at your posture. He's leaning forward. You're slouching back. You're asleep. No, but <laughs> everybody's different. So I need to know who you are. And then I can turn you into fat nose and sour belly, right? So a lot of these are the people that lived with me, married me, uh, run the local supermarket. I'm shameless about going and asking people to pose for me. Uh, so don't hang around me too long after the talk, <laughs> unless. Um, that's the uh, brother of the man who ran Games Workshop. That's John Olson. Timothy Olson ran the workshop itself. He lived downstairs. I ran down and forced him and his cat to pose. <laughs> the cat was a ride. Listen, Johnny, I'll throw your cat. All right. Um, skeletons. Skeletons I love, I collect. If you come to my house, it looks pretty scary if you don't like skeletons. <laughs> I had to buy a big baseball cap, waist two sizes too big, and put it over the human skull in the room because my wife stopped visiting. Um, and by now I'm starting to come up with stupid, crazy things to suggest again. And he hasn't said no. Sometimes I think I came up with the craziest, stupidest ones to make him say no, and he never did. I have a three-headed woman. She's walking through mirrors like they're water. Okay. God bless you, Ian. So, this I knew would get rejected. This I knew. No, no, Ian, it's you. <laughs> and you're chained to the wall. And your hands been chopped off and nailed to the door. Okay. Now, here's a behind-the-scenes story that very few people know. So I'd only done the pencil for this. Um, as, I, as Douglas Adams says, the man who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide, I love deadlines. I love the sound of them whooshing by. That's me too. And I was famously late for a lot of these books because you're just pouring your time into them. You just love them. I had to do studies. I had to do research. So I hadn't finished this one. I went to Penguin Books and delivered them all. And I said, oh, there's, there's one more. One more. Here's the pencil for it. I will do it tonight. And they went, no, Ian. You will do it now. <laughs> do you have your pen and inks? Yes. Because, of course, you carry them everywhere, being an artist. Uh, okay. There's an empty room. Sit down. 
Beacons. <laughs> I did. I did all of that in Penguin Books. And they forgot about me. And they went home. <laughs> all of them. This is the giant three-story Penguin Books that used to be down on uh, the Oscars down in Chelsea, I think. And they locked me inside. So here I am, all alone, in Penguin Books. A man who loves books like dragons, like bears. All alone! So, I will not tell you what happened in the next few hours, but Ian's so happy! And then he realizes he has to go home. How do you get out of a locked building? So I went downstairs to the front door. It's a giant glass door, three locks, spaced almost inhumanly wide apart. But I found I stood on the bottom block, and if I reached up and grabbed tight to this one, and I used my hips, I could do all three locks at the same time. <laughs> the alarms went off. I'm sure the lasers were coming. Now the police are running. And I just casually stepped through the door. <laughs> so that's, that's how this came to be. It started going to my head. Yes, I became a card. <laughs> um, I started illustrating a few other but fighting, not fighting fantasy, just fantasy game books. This was for the Lone Wolf series that Joe Huber did, did two of those. Um, I'd run out of people to draw, so I drew me. And then Steve Jackson was kind enough to turn me into a card. Finally, along came Death Trap Dungeon. And for me, that was the ultimate. That was the best. Some of those earlier ones might have been from that too, I've forgotten. But for Death Trap Dungeon, Ian invited me in so early on in that book and allowed me to put so much input that uh, it's a very special, special book for me. It reminds me of my, my life at the time, my courtship, my marriage that started around the band, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, if it shows in the art, I'm really proud. But I did so much cross-hatching, so much tiny little cross-hatching. You'll notice in some editions of the book, it goes solid black, because it doesn't print. But boy, does it look good in person. Um, again, they slapped some toe, but this time I didn't put anything up there. I got to slip in all kinds of clues. I started loving this Easter egg thing where you hide stuff that people can find later. For example, do you trust this man? Would you get in his basket? <laughs> so I started using body language. I started using all kinds of... Uh, subtle things that we use to judge other human beings. So you would know, you would know from the art which way to go, which path to go on. Because those books are really friggin' hard, right? Anything I could do to help you, I would do. This guy, do you go in and have lunch and discuss the dungeon, or do you rush in and chop his head off? Hopefully the fact that he's already killed and turned a monkey into a rug and a bunch of other things should tell you to chop his head off. <laughs> so all of that, and then I, I started moving on into other areas in my life. I did a record cover for Jethro Tull. I did my first concept art for movies for a producer of Alien and Blade Runner. And Ian tempted me back by saying, well, we'll do this one together. We really think of it together. So there were many incarnations of this book, right? Three to be exact. And one of them is a strange thing called Weird World that it's too weird to be able to show you right now. Um, another one was King Arthur Story. And finally I realized, no, this has to go back to fighting fantasy. So it became, for me, the ultimate fighting fantasy. And there are so many things hidden inside the pictures, it's insane. You can turn them upside down, you can hold them to mirrors, you can put a drop of water on it, magnify this part, and everything will turn into something else. And you are there, reflected in this ball you can't see because it's too close. There's a picture of you there right in the front. Um, yeah, this is, by the way, for people who, how many artists in the room? Okay, how many people watch Game of Thrones? See? You are all artists. You train yourself every time you watch that program. Everybody who knows how to really draw a dragon wing knows you don't draw them like this. Because right? that's a big paddle. It can't move. There's no wrist. There's no little airfoil in the front here so he can dive and come back up again. I didn't know. 
So there's a lot of mistakes in my early paintings, and you'll see what happened to me once I discovered the computer. Yeah, these guys, these guys are just torturing this in the front because it's about a land that has been conquered. People, creatures rush in. Uh, the monster takes the one device that was meant to protect the world, this thing that can steal souls, and the, the guardian is waiting for the bad guy to come so he can steal his soul and save the land, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and he falls asleep. And then the demon shows up, lifts the box out of his hand, and when the wakes up again, realizes it's gone, the demon steals his soul, and then it's all over for the world. All the good guys get thrown in the pit, have to wrestle, mud wrestle with things, and all the new demons and orcs and horrible creatures get to enjoy their crippled beverage. Um, this used to be the great wizard of the land. He's now being forced to do evil and horrible things. But just an example, you are looking for an object here. You're looking for a, uh, I think it's a scarab amulet. Can you all see the scarab amulet? If you go from one red dot to the other and actually draw yourself through the maze, you will draw the amulet. <laughs> This one, can anybody see the golden chalice? If you take a red filter and hold it up in front of this and turn it upside down, everything red turns black and there all the rest of it turns into this golden chalice. I won't tell you what this one is. It's a mad fold. You have to fold it across and match the two things together. And as well as the puzzles, I'm slipping stuff in here of this. I <laughs> I wonder if he had more notice that this skull looks remarkably nice. <laughs> it's got a caterpillar. <laughs> and by the way, that is another great illustrator in the center there. That is my wife, or my wife to be. Um, and then, of course, you almost kill them all, because that's what happens in these things. And in Game of Thrones, you do kill them. But here they are, about to die, and you have to now, well, I can't give it away in case you still play the book or get the book and whatever, but you have to do something at the end and save the world. And if you do, he is returned from being a skeleton to this wide-eyed young man. By the way, this is a little watercolor the size of your thumbnail. I know, right? Bizarre. I can see that then. <laughs> All right, jump forward in time. I am now 60 years old as of this March. Things had changed. Look at the wrinkles. I had more hair then than I was March. What the heck? <laughs> well, here's some of the things that happened. First of all, I moved. I no longer live here in Britain. I moved to Canada. That was after a 10-year journey in San Francisco drawing Star Wars for George Lucas. And then I went north with my pitiful little salary in American dollars at the best financial time to use it in Canada. And I bought a mansion and a mountain top as well. Just a little bit of that. So here I am, and I want a lighthouse. No. I wish! But this is, this is a spit of land that goes off a quarter of a mile into the water, and if I ever do a film studio again, this will be my logo. As you run up towards the end, on your horse, dragons will rise up out of the water. Free spray on the lookout. Don't have a name for it, no. I might get a prize away if anyone can give me a good one. I, I also live in a tree. Or more correctly, I live right behind that tree that you can walk up down onto my second floor balcony. And here I am in my studio. I only ever draw with lizards on my head. <laughs> and this is this picture of what you need to do in Casket of Souls. You need to appeal to the lady of the lake. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is my wife. And I proposed to her right after doing uh, Death Trap Dungeon. I had a commission to do the cover for Jethro Tull. I was also planning to go to Paris and propose to this young lady. And uh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't propose and finish the record cover. Jethro Tull's my favorite band. I'm very fond of her. What do you do? So I told her I couldn't go. I didn't know I was going to propose. I told her I couldn't go. And that was, I watched her turn with a smile on her face. She started putting the pillowcases on the pillow. She's going to go to bed, let me get back to work. I'm like, don't marry me. Please marry me. And she just she smiled from the pillows and went, yes. And back to making the bed. It's like, I love you. And suddenly the door burst open. All the neighbors from downstairs at that exact moment thought I needed orange juice. They all came in with glasses and 
It was like they planned it, but they hadn't. It was magical. So we had this amazing little celebration. I kicked them all out. She went to bed, and I started working with Dr. Joy. Um, she knew I was taking her to Paris to propose now, so while I was working on Jethro Tull by myself, I got a postcard from France with a list of all the things we did together. It was a postcard with a picture of the bridge where I was going to propose to her. And she said, I said, I do. <laughs> it's been 35 years, so we're still there. We also have gone up to Hanky Pranky and look, two children. <laughs> Everybody's grown up now. We've all grown mustaches. Uh, my daughter has temporarily moved back from Los Angeles, so we now have two dogs. This one and this one. Dogs are a lot of work, but they're great to draw. Okay. Also, in the meantime, I did do that stint in California. I did go to work on Star Wars and. That was uh, next to fighting fantasy, one of the best experiences of my life. Not because I was a Star Wars fan. I was too old. I grew up without Star Wars in my life. I read a book called Dune by Frank Herbert. <laughs> Changed my life. If you haven't read it, oh my god. So that was my hero. Were books, Ray Bradbury, all these great authors. I just, my head filled with so many pictures from their stories and then we blew up. If I didn't draw, it wouldn't blow up. So, I, uh, I'm working. I need a job. Someone suggests I show my portfolio to George Lucas. I sort of remember who that is. No, I don't know who he was. But I wasn't dying to work on the film, and I sent my portfolio up. But I worked with Doug Chang, who was the head of that art department, on a little film called Terminator 2. And Doug invited me back up, looked at my portfolio, showed it to George, and they said yes. And that was how I got my job on Star Wars. And everyone else is 10 years younger and played with Star Wars toys as their first memory and would die for that film. And I felt such a phony up there. <laughs> but I started recognizing that Star Wars was actually pretty cool. Pretty cool because it's based on mythology. In fact, it's all mythology. He plundered everything. He threw it in there. This is why I think Star Wars is so enduring, by the way, is that he just threw it in there. He didn't make it make sense. Look, there's a hero! Oh my god, the princess is in danger! No, ooh, give him a lightsaber! It's all this magic, all this adventure from all the great classics. And suddenly now, you've got the story that we don't like chaos. We're not creatures of chaos, we're creatures of order. If you just do this on a piece of paper long enough, you will make it into a face or something, because that's what we do. So people look at Star Wars and they look at this crazy hodgepodge of stuff, and they make sense of it for themselves. Everybody writes their own Star Wars story. Right? That's why when the prequels came out, because for years everybody said to George Lucas, come on, this is what I think it is, right? This is what it is. And George kept saying, I'm not going to tell you, but go make a TV series out of it. Go make a comic. Hey, do a game and stop bothering me. And no, they all wanted to know, George George, but come on, what is it for us? Come on, tell us. And he went, okay. And he made the prequels. And he said, this is what Star Wars is. And what did we say in response? Did we say thank you? <laughs> did we? No. We said, ah, George, you destroyed my childhood. And worse, it got worse. People started getting really angry. There were death to Jar Jar websites. You could kill him seven different ways. They even posted things like, George, you're fat. You keep keep something in that neck, you're pumping your money, right? Yeah, you keep your money in there. Poor George, jeez. Shame on us. Because we all kind of joined in. It was me. You know, so he backed away. And now we're left with, and what is Star Wars? And this isn't a Star Wars talk, so I won't answer that. But imagine you are the Walt Disney Company. You have just spent $4.5 billion to buy a franchise. One of the world's biggest franchises. Half of which, the characters are dead. <laughs> you bought a dead Yoda. You bought a dead Anakin. You bought a dead Obi-Wan. You can make prequels, but what are you going to do? You can't use them anymore. You're going to bring one back, but you bring them all back. Where is the audience going to go? Right? You're fat! <laughs> so, they're in real trouble. They've got to figure out what Star Wars is now. 
So, so far, they've played it safe, and they've said, it's what George said it is. <laughs> so with the new films, keep your eye on it. Keep your eye. Watch the moment where they get brave. Watch the moment where some visionary takes the same risk George did and comes forward and tries to tell you what it is. Fortunately, I will not be there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so everybody got to invent Darth Maul, got to chop him in half and kill him. I got to invent this girl. Um, she was 14 years old. She was supposed to be, and I need a face, right? Because I need to draw a character. It was a really great little film called Nail the Professional. I loved that. And it, I remember the girl, Natalie something. And it, she's dead in that movie. And I just started counting the years, and holy cow, she's 14. She's perfect. So I just kept drawing her, and drawing her, and drawing her. And finally George goes, do you know this girl? <laughs> and I said, no, George, but she's your queen. <laughs> oh, the power. <laughs> because she was cast the next week. It went to my head, and I started doing all the characters. Nobody ever got cast again in my life. <laughs> she did. Anyway, so we killed her, too. Um, yeah, I uh, got to try and imagine Yoda back to young Yoda. Uh, we didn't kill him, but we did banish him to a swamp. And then kill him. Um, anyway, after Star Wars, I decided to go and all those classic bits of mythology that I had seen in Star Wars, I wanted to illustrate them. I wanted to go and try the actual stories. So I, I illustrated Alice in Wonderland. I'm still working on it. It will probably take me till I'm 82, then I will publish it. The thing you have to do when you approach a classic is you have to find something personal just for you in that classic, right? Otherwise, it's not yours. Anybody can illustrate Alice in Wonderland. But for me, I look through all these beautiful pictures, Rectangle and the Wrath of Rackham, and Alice is seven years old, and she's not smiling. If you know seven-year-old kids, they smile, usually shriek, usually do crazy things. So Alice needs to do that. So here's my Alice. She's listening to this mouse tell its long and sad tale, and she can barely stop from laughing. Because all of these crazy characters are inside her head. Especially the bad ones. Now, it's true, too, that you become what you draw. I started going slightly mad. <laughs> I drew dinosaurs that laughed all the time. To try and remedy that, I went back to film for a short while. I worked on Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. I got to do the Dark Mark, which you barely ever see in the movie, but it's important in the book. I got to try Mad Eye Moody. He was going to be a real badass at one point. Leather, all kinds of cool things. And maybe Tom Waits. I was trying to cast the movie again. <laughs> For those of you who don't know Tom Waits, he's, he's just going to really sing like this. He's got a really key voice. I'm mad I'm moody. <laughs> they didn't. I got to run this crazy shark guy. I nearly had this neck. He's going to play an instrument. Of course he'd use his neck. Uh, there was going to be the Weird Sisters. And so I got to design the entire band. This was the three Weird Sisters there. This was their organist. Carried her organ on her back. Yeah, it was really fun, really great. It encouraged me to continue on in films, but to do classics, to find films that really had meaning because they stood the test of time. And I did finally four versions of the one that was a big inspiration for George on Star Wars, and that was A Princess of Mars. This was an earlier version directed by the guy who did uh, Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. This is the red princess who inspired Princess Leia. Yes, she has a book with me. These are the Tharks, the big tough Tharks of the world, who are the warlike creatures. I love that they were green. I love that John Carter, this man from Earth, goes up and tries to civilize this savage land, because this is written by a guy who's never written a book before. And it's written like a high school student would write a book. And sentences are so long and so big, so strong. Every man is strong, every woman is beautiful, and they all fall in love. That's great. But, um, not well written. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, that kind of showed. You know, when, when they stayed close to the book in the movie, it didn't quite work. So everybody tried to change it. Everybody tried to make 
John Carter and Dejan Thoris not fall in love with each other right away. It wasn't love at first sight. Cynical today. Who believes in love at first sight and understands that? Nobody. There's nobody, nobody, something makes him argue. And John Carter, in the books, he's a fighting man, right? He fought for the South, but he's a fighting man. And when he fights, he freaks people out because he smiles. He's having such a good time. And then the war's over and he's got nothing left to fight. So he starts to go to pieces and he decides to go and, and go to dangerous lands and look for gold and all that stuff, desperate to find somebody to fight again. He gets sucked to Mars. And it's all about war up there, and he's home. And what he does is, just like Tarzan, he brings a sense of honor to this planet over three books, right? And this is written by a guy who's never written a book before. He's been a soldier, he's been a farmer, he's been all kinds of things, and he's terrible at all of them. He's broke, he has two kids, and he's trying to sell the ads in the back of those Pulp Fiction magazines. And he's leaping through reading the stories because nobody's calling. And he goes, these are terrible. I could write this. Well, very expensive as a mark. Unexpectedly, it becomes a bestseller. They call up, the publishers call up and say, would you write a sequel? He goes, I don't do sequels. So he writes Tarzan of the Apes. And then he writes four or five other franchises. And then he suddenly gets over his fear of sequels and he writes 11 John Carter books. And many, many Tarzan books. I think Tarzan even meets John Carter at some point. Okay, so I, I worked on this series for quite a while. Just iconic things that, you know, you'll see them in Star Wars too. This is like the Rancor. Later in the prequels, this was like the arena, right? Here's John Carter fighting these giant apes. Here's John Carter going to see the woman that he loves, but it's almost too late, because she's going to marry the bad guy. And really, the only thing that stuck with me from four of these things, and finally getting the Pixar one done, which really didn't do good when it came out, is I really enjoyed drawing green things. So there are big green things picking on red things. So I, I'm always taking the clothes off too. Because I think it's great, because I love bodies. Bodies are amazing. They are the most amazing creatures in the world. We are, right? Why do we wear this stuff? Oh, God, me, God. Me. So I run up to the next green project I could possibly get. <laughs> They're finally redoing the Hulk inside the Avengers. And I love the Hulk. I love him, he's great. But the reason those other Hulks didn't work, Bruce Banner was angrier than the Hulk. What the heck? And then in the Avengers, what happened? They cast Mark Ruffalo. Mark Ruffalo's a sweetheart. And he's not angry. Or he's angry all the time. But you know, he does it with a smile on his face. So that the Hulk can be a monster, finally. Woo, that was fun. I worked on Guardians of the Galaxy. They said, this film cannot be made because it's got a talking tree. It's got a raccoon. I went, I know raccoons. I live with raccoons. I do. I've got a family in my backyard. They're freaking scary. Does anybody know raccoons? Oh my god. I hope you never meet one in the dark. Right? Big teeth, too. Sharp. And they're long. And they stand up. And they have machine guns. <laughs> No, I, when we were doing Guardians, another quick true story. Uh, when the director, James Gunn, told us, you know, let's try draw mutant raccoons, ones that kind of had human faces and stuff. And James Gunn went, no, 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 it's, it's just a raccoon. And I got it. I was like, oh, yeah. He goes, no, no, you don't. I'll show you. And he called us into the room the next day, and there's a cage sitting on the floor. And there's a raccoon inside. And everybody's like, oh, cool, and I'm back in the way. <laughs> And he's, he has two animal trainers there, so we're, we're safe, everything's fine, he's going to open the door and let it out. But he's talking away about raccoons, and what wonderful, lovable creatures are, how they're blind practically, but when they touch something with their hands, they can't see. It makes a picture in their head. He's doing all that, and meanwhile, I look at the cage, and his hand comes out of the cage, and the raccoon spins its hand 180 degrees back towards the lock which it proceeds to undo. <laughs> the cage door swings open. I'm... <laughs> Nobody hears me because they're waxing lyrical. The raccoon comes out. The trainers see him. And they go, Nobody worry. Nobody move. Right? And whip out some food. Because that's how you control animals, right? Not raccoons! <laughs> he looks at the food. He looks at my shoelaces. He wants the shoelaces. 
<laughs> you know, they're already starting to untie my shoes. I'm like, oh, there's nothing on it. So I got to work on that project. Stupid fun. I'm really enjoying the film industry. But at the same time, I'm missing books. I'm missing it where it's you alone in a studio and you get to do your own thing. I'm also getting fascinated in teaching you to do what I do. Because you can. Who draws? Who thinks they can't draw? Everyone that's just said that, you have to put the word yet at the end. You can't draw yet. The reason is that drawing is a language. It's not a magic ability, right? You tried to speak it before you ever tried words. You probably picked up something and made scribbly marks. You drew the big round head with the legs coming out of it when you were a kid. It's because you naturally speak pictures. Does anybody watch television? Anybody watch movies? You are training yourselves in pictures, right? So, like any language, you just need to spend six months, one hour a day practicing and learning the grammar and vocabulary, and you can draw, which is what this DVD says to people. There's four of them, and they teach you to draw the concept design to tell stories. That's more of this crazy story. I took Hans Christian Anderson's Little Mermaid, and I made it a science fiction story. So I go further. I started going to things like the illustration master class. Here I am looking old and haggard, but I'm having so much fun. And I'm helping students over a week-long thing to learn to draw and to tell stories. I'm going after this. I go eventually to Paris and then to Portugal to teach another week-long course to all the filmmakers and animators in Europe, and actually all over the world, because it's the best. It's not the best for me. Um, it's not a superstar thing, right? You don't go and go, ha ha, I can give you this power. You have the power. The fun for me is coming to a class like this and going, let me show you what you can do. And then I show you where to poke. You poke it, and suddenly the sky revolves. You realize, oh my god, I have mutant powers. <laughs> Drawing is like that. I can show you in 15 minutes that you can draw better than you think you can. It's really easy. In fact, see me after class, I'll show you how. <laughs> All right, so I'm helping at the illustration master class. I'm teaching with great artists, you know, Boris Vallejo, and Donato Giancolo, and uh, just Trig Manchester has just written an amazing book that he's done 240 paintings for. And of course, you get to teach in cool places like dinosaur museums and so on. Um, I decided to put it all together in a book so I could talk about the creative process. Because it's not all about what brush do you use, what paint do you use. It's about what goes on in here that you walk away from the real world, you walk into this strange land that's covered in deadlines and muses that inspire you sometimes when they show up. And you have graphite spears in your hand, you lunge into battle with the picture, and you come up covered in graphite blood, at which point someone calls you for lunch downstairs. You stagger out of the studio like the Hulk, sit at the table and try to remember how to form sentences. That's what it is to be an so I wrote this book to tell you all about it. It's called Shadowland. It's out of print now. We'll be back in print next year. In the middle, it looks like there's chewing gum stuck in. Those are booklets. You pull them out. It's a drawing class. If you do all of the things in those booklets, it will teach you how to draw. There you are. And it's also got all of my work that nobody ever got to see. There's a vault in there of projects that never happened. And it's got the true story of a man who wants to write the world's greatest graphic novel, but he can't draw. So he comes to my fantasy other world thing that's only in my head and has the experience of his lifetime. He actually kills me at one point in the book. I do a lot of demos to show people a process to show you how to do paintings like this. By the way, it's not just a wildlife painting. It has to have a story behind it to me. Uh, this is for a book on endangered animals. And yes, I love the orangutans. And yes, we must save the poor critters on our planet because we are killing them. So this is to raise a lot of money for that. But I didn't want to just do an orangutan. It has to be a certain orangutan. This guy's name is Talon. Orangutans die about 25 years old in the wild. He was 52. He lived in a zoo. He was the inspiration for the orangutan in the new Planet of the Apes movies. He was an artist. He was a gentle soul. And he moved in a very special way. So the actor who was doing the motion capture for the movie sat with him in his cage and learn how to move and walk and talk. He passed away last year, so I did this portrait. 
and this is how I start. You get a blank sheet of paper. You grab some paint. You start drawing. You draw with the paint because if you draw with a pencil and then draw with the paint, you're doing it twice. I want the line to be the line, right? And you have to find it. And there's that nervousness, and nervousness is good. Before I do this, I do about two dozen drawings of that orangutan in pencil until I can draw them with my eyes closed. So I've memorized them. Then I pick up the paintbrush on a blank piece of paper and I draw it. There is. Draw them in one color. It's called an underpainting. There's my underpainting board. This is all watercolor, by the way. Watercolor, which they tell you you can't change. <laughs> but they're wrong. They're wrong. Ever heard of bleach? <laughs> Don't use your paper brushes. Then I go into each section and I, I try to put in my darkest darks and my lightest light areas in the place I most want you to look. Just in case I run out of time, that piece will be finished. So here we are, notice that the leaves on the side have no texture, no detail. So I'll build it up in layers like that. The ones on the right, I started to put the veins and everything else, until finally you end up with something that looks like this. And in case you want to know, that process takes about four days if you're working slow. Right? Otherwise, you could jam it out in a day. Um, the problem with teaching people is they grow up and become famous artists and then hire you. <laughs> and it's impossible to refuse when an old student calls you and says, Ian, please, I've never asked you a favor before, but we're making a game called Titanfall. We don't have any characters for our game. Can you please just make us a ragtag band? And I went, well, all right. Do we have a story? No, no. Make one up for us. <laughs> so you have to give me one word. Just a word. What do they do? Who are they? She's... Badass girl, like Sarah Connor from Terminator 2. Okay, there she is. Ta da! And actually, that ended up becoming the main character in Titanfall. None of the others were in the game yet. But there was a chef. Here he is. This is, I think, the first version of him. Did I put the second? No, I didn't. Darn. All right, he's the chef. That's a big butcher knife on the back. There's another one where he has a huge alien creature on his shoulder here. It's the fresh meat that he cut up. In this version, he didn't have any fresh meat, so he chopped his own arm off and boiled it up, because the, the meal must go on. Um, and then about this time, I'm deciding to go and do my own thing. Right? Enough working on classics and other people's stories. I don't want to do my books. So that day, I got a call from Star Wars. The Force has awoken. We need you. So I went back. And I went back and, yes, throwing out ideas, trying to help Disney figure out what the heck Star Wars actually is. I thought, how cool, we have a young lady this time as the main character. I know, let's make her a scavenger. So here she is, fishing a familiar part of a droid out of a junk heap. She was going to put another half of the same droid on the bottom and turn it into a ball. <laughs> uh, got to be weird, weird, mad, crazy stuff, because I like that. And it was great because for a long time we had no story, we could just do any images we want. So it was fun for a while. Then we realized they didn't know what it was, and then I started losing interest again because I don't make stories that way. Do you know why stories are important to me? When I went to art school, I thought, oh my god, here I am, I'm not becoming a doctor, I'm not, not saving the world. I have just put my whole life aside because I'm just going to enjoy myself and build pictures. What a loser. And it's taken me. 30, 40 years to realize that stories are probably the most important things that we have. Right? And pictures are just another language to tell them, but they really are. Because from the moment you're born, you write a story about you. Who you are, what you want to be, what you believe in, what you don't believe in, what your friends are going to be like, what you're going to stand for in the world, right? And you spend the rest of your life trying to make it come true. You make it up. So you better know how to make up good stories, right? And when something bad happens, it shakes the world, like the guy who wasn't supposed to be president gets elected president, and it shouldn't happen that way. You rewrite your story to make that make sense too. So like I say, learn how to make good stories because it shapes your life and the life of everyone on the planet. So, I decided to become Yoda. 
try to teach everybody how to write stories and make stories by setting that example. I'm currently working on uh, a DVD set that will come up with schoolism showing you how to make a classic and make it your own and make money because you shouldn't have to starve for your art. If you can't make money at it, you can't keep doing it. So that course comes out in about a year and a half um, and it will be how to illustrate an open copyright classic. Well, oh, that's what I showed you. Okay. Yeah. So back on The Force Awakens, we were trying to figure out how do we make Star Wars like things? And then some, some bright spark said, I know, let's, let's put a Yoga character in it, but let's make Meg as a lady this time. You do it, Ian, you like that, Ian. So that was my Lady Yoda. <laughs> was not the one chosen for the film, but oh, I wish. I wish, look, she's a caterpillar. <laughs> I worked on all kinds of other things that I'm not supposed to be showing you. So don't look at this picture of young Han Solo. God. And then I did one last film because, again, an old friend called me up, John Favreau, and worked with him on his John Carter, and he wanted me to come and help him on the Jungle Book. And Jungle Book, that's the first movie I saw in the movie theater. I loved the Jungle Book. And I read the Kipling books, and I loved them too. So I went back one last time. I designed, helped design every character in that movie except Billy the Crab. For some reason, he didn't like that Billy the But even Mowgli. I drew the one human in there and he pinned it to the wall and made them find a boy that looked like that. I'm so proud. So, Dan, I want to talk about this character. Notice he has horns on his head. And he is a character of evil. And people tend to think that it's this guy. Look at this guy closely, please. Does he have horns on his head? He does not. What does he have? Stiffened black feathers. Because I thought, all right, what turns you into a Sith Lord? Pain. Pain. Every morning when he gets up, he doesn't brush his teeth. He gets his chicken wire, which has stiffened black feathers on it, and he wraps his head until he bleeds. And it has to be in the right place where he has to take it all off and do it again. It wasn't going to be in the movie, I knew, but I needed to find a reason why he was all pissed off all the time. <laughs> also, I needed a person. I needed a thing of evil. I used everybody. There was no one left, so I used me. So that was me, but chicken wire and black feathers on my head, not horns. This went off to the special effects department in London. Nick Dunman, who was amazing, amazing special effects makeup artist, looked at it and went, Oh, I like the horns. <laughs> so is he San Bargon? Hell no. Not by me, but by fate. <laughs> and there he is, old Zambar. The thing I like about San Bargon that I just desperate to go back and continue to work on, bone, it's bone. What happens if you break your bone? It heals. Why does it heal? It heals because it's alive. Bone isn't dead like hair. Bone is alive. And it grows all the time. Here's a guy with projectiles of bone. What happens over 30, 40 years? He grows more bone. What does he look like now? I want to draw it! <laughs> so, I got a call from John Green. I'm doing a book called You Are the Hero. Would you come back one last time and do a draw? I don't know, Zanbar going, yes! <laughs> But this is still the Zanbar bone from City of Thieves, so I couldn't go too far away. But he's a little spikier and more twisted than he is in City of Thieves. And I got to go back and do my blood beast, but by now, I actually know what animal anatomy looks like. I know what those little bugs that will live forever and outlive us look like, too, the little party grades. And some of the other horrible parasites that are living on you right now, and I use that for the blood beast. Yeah. Ah. And I'm starting to get bit by the bug. Because now I can use computers. And remember those wings that didn't make any sense? They still don't make any sense. But I got to fix the picture. I got to put some depth into it. I got to raise it up. I got to make him in a better pose and get the horse the right size. Just, what are you doing? I thought you'd be paid for this. What am I doing? But it's fun. It's fun to go back and fix it. I did this when 1988, so just before I left to go work in the film industry. I did this painting. I was really proud of it. Well, now I look at it. It hurts. It hurts because look at that face. Seriously, right? Someone let the air out of it. 
It only bites sometimes. <laughs> and I saw that and I went, oh my gosh, that's who she is. She has a snake. I still don't know what she does, but she has a snake. And so he said, yeah, can, can we not have that? Can we have a, an orc character instead? Can Mungo be smaller? So before he sell, told me anything else, I told him, he said, yes, but I've started painting. <laughs> And notice too, remember, I draw with the paint. But I couldn't on this because it was so precise and so many characters. And I was so terrified this was going to end up all stiff and not lifelike. So I kept everything as loose as I could. Then I came in, I painted my yellow. I put some tone on it. I sent it to Ian to show him kind of what the effect would be for the final thing. He approved it. I jumped on painting it. Put my darks in first in the area I most want you to look at, the garment. But notice there's nothing on the arms of the garment there. Eh? I know he's going to have tattoos, but I don't know what. I put Mungo in the front. I put his friend over there, who's an artist, by the way, a great artist from uh, LA that only has one eye. As do I, by the way. Did you all know I don't have sight in that eye? Yeah, that's another story that I can't tell you now. <laughs> but it's miraculous and it pulls a tree branch and all kinds of cool things. Anyway, so here I am and I'm filling up the picture and I'm building it up towards here. And I suddenly notice, now just paint the top and put the shadows when you're done. And I don't know what those things are up there. I worked too sloppy and loose and I hadn't thought them through. So I tried actually painting them and it was a disaster. It was just a blob of yucky, skinny stuff. And you could have left it because it was tight over that and all that. But no! No, I had to erase them, figure out the backstory, redraw them in paint. Now the tattoos are starting to appear on the arm, and it tells a story. The story is that this bartender, he's noticed that, they, that there's a, a tentacled creature here, and look, there's a tentacled creature behind him. He killed it. And look, there's a sea serpent on the other arm, and there's a sea serpent head on the wall. Oh my gosh. He's quaint from Jaws. He goes out and he fights sea monsters. And he made enough money to buy a bar. So everybody started getting their backstories now. There's the final cover, but the stories are there. I'll tell you real quick. There's the barman in his bar. There's the two girls that he knew when they were all young. They're sisters, they're the red-eyed sisters. Then they went their separate ways, just like Game of Thrones. One came back and she's a ninja. The other came back and she's awesome too. I know it is. <laughs> but they came back because they had the hawks for the barman. And there they are. He's ignoring them, but he goes there man. And then in the foreground, we have my snake lady. I still didn't know what she was until the last minute. I put those gloves on her, and it looked like a snaky thing. And I realized she's a poison seller. She's now making a dangerous deal, selling an immediately fatal poison to the dwarfy man in the center who you have just caught in the middle of the deal. And he's really pissed off. And that's his brother who tried to betray him in the front there, and he hired this elf and these guys here to do him in. And they got caught, because you opened the door and put this light across everything. And there's the poor orc. There's a dead giant in this week, by the way. You can't see him. But anyway, there's, there's an orc, and he just came in for a piece of meat. And he's not getting to eat it, because you interrupted him. Bless you. Anyway, just to answer that final question. The bar. Is it or is it not Ian Livingston? <laughs> Hands up who thinks it's Ian Livingston. Hands up who thinks it's not Ian Livingston. I can tell you now, categorically, you are all right. <laughs> it is and it isn't. Of course I looked at Ian. Of course I studied his features. He's he's got round, happy cheeks, he's got smile lines. He, that's not a badass barman. So I looked at me, and I pulled all the meanest faces, and then about that time we're rebuilding our front stairs. We're, we're on a three-story house, so it's a two-story set, two set of stairs. And one guy is single-handedly carrying everything, hammering it together, and it's beautiful. And he looks like that. <laughs> Coincidentally, it was easy to put a little of me in there and a little of me, but no. That's the guy who built my stairs. All right, so. Where you, can you see my work now? What am I doing? You can't see the book I'm doing for about a year and a half now, or the course that goes with it, or the gallery show that goes with that. Um, I still teach, though. I'm going to Portugal now to teach for a week at THU. You never guess that that means the Trojan horse was a unicorn. <laughs> Don't ask. Um, 
And I support a group called Spectrum, which does an annual that shows the year's best science fiction and fantasy work. And this year, I was lucky enough to do the comic. So there you are, ladies and gentlemen. And that's where we are today. <laughs>